Hello and welcome to today's webinar uh, in this series of suicide prevention webinars. Um, we're focusing today on suicide risk assessment and formulation and we're very pleased to welcome back Keith Horton, uh, who Marie will introduce in just a minute. So Marie will be chairing again today, our Chief Nurse. Before we start, I just wanted to um, recognise really that as we have these webinars regularly, um, many of us are touched by suicide in, in professional and personal ways and it can be difficult sometimes to um, perhaps you know get invitations in the diary or, or, or be thinking about um, suicide and hearing about it. In the chat in a second you'll see a link to an organisation called Support After Suicide and I just wonder if this is something that if you are affected or you think that colleagues or friends or family members might be affected by suicide please share. It's a really, really good website. It um, has a link to a document called Help is at Hand that's a really helpful booklet for people affected by the death of a friend or family member by suicide. And um, it's signposts to local and national support agencies. And hereafter, when we send the uh, diary invites out, we'll put a link to that in the diary invite as well so that we can help our colleagues and um, everybody in the Oxford Health family to access support as they need it. OK, thank you. So I'm going to hand over to Marie, who will say a few words before Keith gives his presentation today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen, and thank you for that. I think it's important that people know where they can um, contact to get help. I think the majority of people, whether we work in services or not, have been touched at some point um, by suicide. So thank you for that. Th and thank you for inviting me back a second time to chair this. I'm really looking forward to hearing what um, Professor Keith Horton has got to say. Just, I just wanted to mention a few things before we move on to that. So I think as mental health professionals, for me, having been a mental health nurse for many, many years, a set sort of assessment of risk and the subsequent risk formulation is an absolute key plank of what we do as mental health professionals. What we do from that in trying to keep people safe is absolutely crucial in terms of moving forward with with helping people and supporting people in their in their recovery. Um, risk assessment and formulation really should drive everything um, um, and, and working uh, really in a co-production way with patients and their families to be able to drive that forward is really important. So safety planning for me and supporting people really at their most vulnerable is, is an absolute privilege, but something we really need to um, improve and help people and give people the tools to be able to do that to, to the best possible ability. We do know that there's much evidence and knowledge, particularly with Professor Keith Horton around suicide um, and suicide risk, uh, suicide prevention and risk planning. Uh, and we do know the some of the indicators now around how we can um, look at people with those increased areas of risk and really intervene in a more proactive way. So just just to finish that to, to that end, as I've been through my career, but certainly the couple of years I've been at Oxford Health and I don't think we're any different to any other organisation. When I chair and look at serious incident reviews and chair panels and also on the back of coroner's notices, prevention of future death notices, um, often the issue around documentation and particularly around risk assessment and risk formulation comes up. Um, so what I what I've just launched as sort of the exec lead for this is a quality improvement program around um, how we improve our, our risk assessment and risk formula formulation and the documentation associated with that. And it was that was really around um, having a trust wide approach and bringing frontline clinicians with, you know, with together with key experts like um, Keith and Karen, the clinical directors, etc., to really drive this forward. So from the ground up, we start to look at the literature, the evidence, and all the knowledge, and turn that into the skills for our frontline staff. So it, it, to that end, sort of watch this space. This is this is something that we really want to be able to do in a timely and. A, a, appropriate appropriate way so it's going to take some time to to deliver on that 
but I think that's a much better way than just having some action plan saying we need to do this, we need to do that, we need to train people more, tell people to do something. Actually, it needs to be driven from the front line. What is the art of the possible? Um, so hopefully people will be involved in that work wherever you are across the trust. As I say, I'm really looking forward now to hearing Keith speak. So um, just to introduce Professor Keith Horton, who some of you um, will know is a consultant psychiatrist in um, at Oxford Health in our trust, and is also director of the Centre of for Suicide Research uh, within the Department of Psychiatry at University of Oxford. Thank you, Keith. Keith, you're mute. That's it, Keith, okay. I think. Sorry, I had this problem last time. It's very, very slow to unmute me. Um, thanks very much for that uh, for that introduction. Um, so I've chosen as my title uh, Suicide Risk Assessment, but with this uh, subtitle, Moving from the Impossible to Suicide Prevention, which I realise is a rather obscure uh, title, but I hope it'll become clearer. Next. Um, as you'll probably all know, um, uh, of course, uh, suicides uh, occur across the population, but are particularly concentrated in people with mental health problems. We know that of the approximate 5,000 deaths by suicide in England uh, per year, some 25 to 30% uh, uh, are either in psychiatric uh, contact with psychiatric services at the time or have been in the year before death. So uh, clearly um, it goes without saying that suicide prevention is very much our uh, business. Next. Um, what I'd like I'm going to cover though is the uh, problem of trying to re predict risk of suicidal behaviour uh, and then to go on to talk about suicide risk formulation and and managing uh, uh, suicide risk. Next. Now this will perhaps come as a bit of a shock to uh, some of you. Um, the great problem uh, of risk prediction is that it simply does not work, at least prediction alone. Next slide. So what is the evidence for this? Um, uh, first of all, I'm going to talk about suicide and then I'll, I'll say a little bit about uh, prediction of repetition of self-harm. Next. Uh, this is a report from the National Confidential Inquiry, um, which I guess um, all of you will have heard of, um, where data are collected on patients who die by suicide uh, while in current or recent uh, clinical care. Uh, next, please. Uh, the, and this is um, data from a uh, report uh, th a few years ago. And um, I asked you, to, I'd like you to look at the bits highlighted in red. And um, this shows, the first um, figure shows um, the responses of clinicians when they were asked, the, the principal clinicians responsible for patients care who died by suicide, when they were asked uh, to estimate whether the risk of suicide at the last clinical contact was um, thought to be uh, high, low or, or medium and uh, or indeed absent. And in 86% of cases, the clinicians said that the risk was uh, either low or there appeared to be uh, no risk. Uh, rather alarmingly, they thought that um, suicide prevention was only possible in, could have been possible in 19% of patients. Next slide. So um, one of the issues is about um, 
uh, what patients have said um, to clinicians uh, at a recent or final clinical contact before dying by suicide. And uh, it seems to be very true from a large number of studies that the majority of patients who've died by suicide have actually denied having suicidal thoughts when asked um, at their last contact uh, before their death. Or in looking back, people have said, well, then they, they were showing behavior which suggested they may have been feeling suicidal, um, but they actually denied risk. A next slide. And this is a recent study, a fairly recent study from the USA, um, in which um, of 157 patients who died by suicide, 132 were evaluated for suicidal intent within 30 days of their dying by suicide. And two thirds of these had denied suicidal intent when last asked. Half of these died within two days of being asked about suicidal intent. So it just it brings home more fully the message that um, uh, it's very common that people who die by suicide will have uh, uh, denied suicidal intention at the last contact. Next slide. Um, why is this? Well, the ob obvious, most obvious um, possibility is stated at the top. In other words, that patients weren't actually thinking about suicide at that time. Um, we know that suicidal thinking can be very trans transient, it can come on fairly suddenly, um, and it can diminish over time. Um, so that may be uh, the, the most obvious reason. And then there's a whole range of other reasons which are, are listed there. I'm not going to go through them all, but um, there may be, you know, worries about uh, they don't want, didn't want to be stopped from carrying out a suicidal act. They may have feel, feared what a clinician would think about them. Um, uh, if they, then they may even have thought that uh, being concerned that they were going to make the clinician feel anxious uh, if they spread, express suicidal ideation. But I think the most common thing is people weren't actually suicidal at the time. Next slide. And the problem is that um, if this is the situation uh, at a clinical contact with no suicidal ideation being expressed, uh, even when the person's asked directly, that the clinical assessment in this regard may conclude no suicidal ideation, and then the risk in this person may be formulated as either low or, or absent. And um, be because we know that patients um, as, a, as a group have a greatly increased risk of suicide compared to other people in, in the population, this is really not an acceptable uh, uh, approach to a care, as I hope will become more obvious. Next slide. Uh, just a little bit about um, self-harm. Um, uh, issues arise with um, trying to predict, in, for example, in people who've self-harmed, are they likely to do it again? Next. Um, we'll just build this slide up. Um, this is um, based on uh, data collected by colleagues in Manchester, and um, it's using a scale to um, allocate people uh, who'd self-harmed into risk categories, low, moderate or high. And you can see that um, uh, in terms of the percentages of uh, individuals repeating self-harm, I think this is over a six month period, um, those in the high risk group, according to the scale, indeed had a higher risk of repetition with 25% of them repeating. But if I had the next slide, please. The important point here is that while that was true, the majority of those who actually repeated self-harm were in the low or moderate risk groups. And, and this demonstrates a key point about prediction uh, in this field. Next slide, please. 
Um, I just give you an example of uh, difficulty uh, of prediction again in 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 self harm patients, and this was a study that um, Karen and I uh, did with. Uh, Colleague, local colleagues at the John Radcliffe a few years ago, where 126 patients were admitted to the John Radcliffe um, with self-harm were assessed using a scale which has been very popular about amongst emergency department physicians called sad person scale. Uh, sad persons, each of the uh, letters in sad person stands for an item in the scale. Um, so uh, S is sex, uh, gender, um, A is um, age, D is depression, uh, and so on. Um, and uh, so these form items within a scale, and there's a particular cutoff point which is said to be uh, predictive. Um, well, let's see how it performed. Next slide. Um, when we compared the scores, those scoring above the cutoff um, on this scale, we found that 65 out of the 70 patients who were thought to need uh, further secondary care after discharge from hospital were not identified by the scale. It missed four out of five of those who the clinicians thought needed admission to psychiatric hospital. And even and more importantly, and particularly in relation to our topic today, it only identified three of those who went on to repeat self-harm within six months. So it failed to identify 28. So not only is this scale useless, uh, I would say it's dangerous if people were to rely on it to decide about um, provision of clinical care. Next slide, please. So there have been now a large number of studies of uh, risk uh, tools, um, particular scales and so on, and uh, they've been reviewed in, in several uh, rev review studies. And next slide, please. The, the, the problem is time and time again, they just do not perform. Um, so they have a an average positive predictive value of about 5%, which means that um, at, in, in only, at only 5% of the time are they correct in identifying people that are predicted as being at high risk, which means they're in that respect wrong 95% of the time. And most importantly, they miss those who are, um, subsequently die by suicide who are identified as low risk and uh, in keeping with, the, with what I said earlier, um, the vast majority are in the, come from the low risk or perhaps moderate risk categories. Next slide. As a result of this, the um, NICE guideline on self-harm published in 2011 um, uh, concluded, do not use risk assessment tools and scales to predict future suicide or repetition of self-harm and do not use these to determine who should be offered treatment and who should be discharged without any specific uh, aftercare. Um, they did add that um, use of assessment tools may have a uh, may be helpful in trying to in, in assisting structuring of assessments but that they shouldn't be relied on for predicting uh, care. Next slide, please. So the limitations um, with using these scales are, are that they produce high false negative rates. Um, and even when you think about it, you know, if you think about your own behavior, I mean, you think you know what you might be doing next week, but um, judging from uh, the past, one knows that predicting exactly what one's going to be doing is extremely difficult. Things crop up um, uh, and even predicting one's own behaviour therefore can be uh, uh, a problem. And it's particularly a problem when you try to predict low rate uh, behaviours such as suicide. Next slide. So what is the alternative to uh, risk prediction? First of all, recognising that risk prediction is very difficult and we shouldn't be spending 
uh, all our time trying to do that, but instead thinking more about dynamic risk formulation, and I'll come on and explain that in a moment, although many of you will be aware of what that means. Um, and particularly thinking about some patients' needs, uh, thinking about using assessment as a, a therapeutic procedure, um, not just uh, trying to identify who might or might not be at risk. Um, using clinical guidelines, make, using evidence-based treatments wherever possible, and very much individualizing assessments to inform management. And uh, in a sense, thinking about a sort of population approach to uh, prevention. So something for everyone, not assigning some people as low or no risk, and then therefore not doing anything in the way of risk prevention. Next slide. And it's a little bit like, you know, what happens if you can shift the population blood pressure level just a, a few pips to the left. In other words, lowering blood pressure in the population. Uh, you can see at the bottom here with just this small uh, change in blood pressure can lead to a big reduction in strokes and uh, coronary heart deaths from coronary heart disease. Uh, and in a sense, it's quite difficult to think this way when you're thinking about an individual patient. But when thinking about a clinical service, I think this is a reasonable analogy. Next slide. please. So it should be about assessment um, and, and uh, uh, prediction. And basically what this slide says is that we can't um, assign scores that will accurately perfect uh, predict risk, but we can use um, uh, um, information gathering to get relevant information to uh, provide a risk formulation that then leads to individual interventions. Next slide, please. So this moves, uh, I'll now move on to, to saying a bit about um, suicide risk formulation. Next slide, please. Uh, and this slide really is, I guess, the the key one uh, from from my talk today, um, and it's about thinking about components of uh, formulating risk in individual patients. Top left is shown static factors, uh, which, in other words, factors which, uh, when they've occurred, they've occurred, and they're sort of permanent, if you like. Um, that uh, may influence uh, people's risk. But key here are um, the fa factors shown top right and bottom left. So top right are dynamic factors, um, changeable factors such as uh, relationship issues, health, physical health, person's um, social circumstances, substance use, uh, their moods, mental health, uh, and uh, so on. Uh, including access to means. And these are changeable factors. Um, and then bottom left are shown factors which may occur in, in future, some of which are predictable, some of which may not uh, be predictable. But I think it's really important that in clinical assessment, one thinks about changes which a an individual may be vulnerable to in, in future, and, and ones that for them may be particular issues. So someone who's had attachment issues all their life and is in a, uh, a, a relationship which is threatened, then clearly the breakup of that relationship may change their, uh, their, their, their risk uh, um, very, very greatly. And then bottom right, of course, are the important personal characteristics which may provide protection, problem solving skills, support from others, family support, and of course, engagement with, with services, insight into problems, hope, and so on. Next slide, please. So what one needs to be doing is really using those uh, elements of that dynamic uh, risk assessment to come up with a formulation for the individual patient that then can be thought about uh, in terms of risk reduction for that individual. Um, and uh, one can argue that one should be thinking about risk reduction in all patients, given that 
we, we find it so difficult to detect the specific patients who are at particular risk. We need to think about um, the population we're working with as being a population at risk and where key elements of intervention are going to be important. So just to uh, finish off, uh, I'll go through some important components of uh, managing risk that will be uh, derived from the dynamic risk formulation. Um, first of all, uh, safety planning. This is something one can do with all patients. Uh, next slide, please. And here's um, a, a version of um, a safety plan which was being used in the trust. I don't know if it's currently the one that's being used. It's probably changed somewhat now. Uh, if the next slide shows the components more clearly of the safety plan. Um, and um, of course, the idea here is that this should be a personal safety plan for the each individual patient and something that can be updated, can be reviewed and updated on a, on a regular basis, including uh, warning signs for an individual um, that may demonstrate that they show that they're getting into difficulties such as sleep disturbance, uh, feeling maybe feelings of uh, being more paranoid and so on. Um, what are the things that patients can do to take their mind off their difficulties, help them cope? And what have they done in the past that's worked? And what can they do um, if they uh, really are feeling becoming unsafe? What can they do to reduce their distress? Um, are there who, who can they call uh, who in the family? Uh, do they know? Does the do the family members know that this person might uh, call them? Um, have they been given a copy of the plan? Uh, what can they do to help? What professional agencies can they call if they can't manage things uh, themselves or with family support? And of course, crisis numbers uh, that can be uh, used to get help in an emergency. Next slide. And then um, well, I've already mentioned this, the importance of using wherever possible evidence based treatments. Um, I, I think, you know, this is one of the I mean, we're, we're good at using evidence based treatments of a physical kind, in other words, uh, medication. So and I think we're less good at um, using uh, psychological uh, psychosocial interventions for which there's a uh, good evidence uh, base. But very importantly, um, remembering that the therapeutic relationship can be absolutely crucial. What one conveys to an individual about one's concern for them, uh, showing warmth uh, and so on. These are, are so important. I mean, they're in, they're in a way the intangibles of our uh, therapeutic intervention, which can be so important, difficult to measure. But we all know from our own personal experience when we've uh, seen someone, when we've been troubled, how important um, uh, a person showing confidence, concern and warmth can can be to us. Next slide, please. And then very importantly, involving uh, family and others. And um, I think uh, th there's a much greater drive in psychiatry to um, sharing, uh, encouraging people to allow one to share um, information with family members. Um, and obviously some people are, are quite resistant to this. And then uh, therapeutic work with individuals to try and help them see what the advantages can be for them if information is shared with family members such that they can provide support, particularly at difficult times, and also how this may be advantageous for the family. It could, of course can be sometimes be very difficult. Uh, next slide. And then um, in, very importantly, uh, having always having in mind um, the fact that access to means for suicidal behavior can greatly increase risk and where it possible, trying to encourage people to get rid of um, potential means for suicidal uh, acts. And lastly, 
um, but certainly not least important, ensuring that plans are clear, that they're communicated, and they are shared with all who have a need to know. Um, and this will, of course, not in, only involve clinicians and the patient themselves, but um, wherever possible, uh, other family uh, members. Next slide. So just in conclusion, uh, really to summarise what I've said, um, suicide risk, that should say prediction, rather than assessment, suicide prediction really does not work and we shouldn't continue to fool ourselves that um, we can uh, predict who's going to die by suicide. And this is why there, it's important that there's this shift in focus from trying to predict risk to this more dynamic and therapeutic approach to uh, risk formulation and individualized risk reduction in all patients. So thanks very much. Next slide, just to finish. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Um, um, just... Yeah, I'm going to ask, I should have, I was going to say, I'm going to ask Karen to help out a bit here, say a little bit more about uh, risk uh, formulation. Well, I don't but think it to, um, no. do it very well. Anyone who um, has uh, done my training will recognise the risk formulation slide um, and hopefully recognise you know a lot of the th things that Keith has been talking about um, so hopefully it reassures you I've learned from the master and that what we're what we're trying to bring into into the trust is um, you know in, an important um, formulation model and one that I'm attracted to because of its relative simplicity and it, it, it's easy to use and when I work with teams to use that model to, to formulate. It's always a really helpful and comprehensive exercise that, that brings people together and really gets people thinking about care planning and safety planning um, and is very helpful. So hopefully this will inform part of the QI work that Marie talked about earlier on. And I think it's also important to note that whilst our sort of topic of interest here is suicide prevention, that risk formulation approach will of course identify other risks, risks of violence, risk of homicide, safeguarding issues um, and, and so on. So it's a really important model to use in that population approach that Keith talked about, to use that model of formulation for all of our patients. So thank you very much, Keith. And I'll uh, hand back to Marie for her reflections before she um, comes back to me for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Keith and Karen. I did smile when you say you'd learned from the master, because I think when I first met Keith, I'd said back in the 90s, I think I'd also learned from you. I hadn't met you, but from all the, your published papers, etc. So <laughs> I did smile at that as well, because I certainly did. And that was really around when I was a liaison mental health nurse, around for immediate formulation. And then I don't think we called it safety planning then, but it really was that about an immediate safety plan somebody go, going home from hospital as it were so so thank you for that it was fascinating I think also and I don't know whether people would be surprised but it did also surprise me knowing about the sort of low risk paradox as it were and chairing a lot of SI panels that American study I think you said it was where two-thirds of people who were asked about suicidal intent and denied that actually died within two days of that um, uh, that that's was was yeah, re really brought, brought it home to me. I guess also over the years of my practice, we often, you know, I've often had conversations with people that have been, um, when, I'm, when I'm trying to formulate um, assessments around, well, they've got social issues going on or they've got relationship issues or all these other sort of factors going on. And actually, I think we need to absolutely take note of those. What we sometimes do in mental health service, I think is silo people into, this is your issue so we can't do that until we've done that or that's a social problem that that's a relationship issue etc and all those things make up the person and I guess you know looking at those future um, risks and dynamic risks and, and factors really play into that for me so that that was important I guess what I was really um, what really came home to me was as a as a mental health nurse I I hope that I base everything that I do and have done in my clinical work on that therapeutic relationship. And I think that shone out for me really as one of the main things to hold is that 
really important. That essence of, of working with somebody holding that hand for them. And it's sort of the, the crucial part of what we do. I think you said confidence, concern and warmth. And I suppose within that, if you're showing that within that empathy, it is actually an, an absolute key thing of that 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 connection with people and is what we, we would want ourselves. Um, I uh, Karen obviously does a lot of training around suicide risk assessment and formulation and safety planning, so we'll be a key person in our quality improvement work going forward. But it's really important that we take the evidence that we've got as 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 Keith went went through today. Um, so yes, I think I'll uh, leave it there and then hand back to Karen because it looks like there's some questions probably for Keith and Karen. Thanks, Marie. In fact, unless I am not, unless I can't access them, I can't see any questions. So uh, if anyone does have questions, please. Um, oh, there might be another one that's come through, come through. Ah, oh, there is one. Is there any evidence about the effectiveness of the risk assessment tool yet? I'll let you answer that one, Keith. Um, when, sorry, I'm um, a bit unclear here. The risk assessment tool I guess that's what we've in a sense been saying doesn't work. Um, that, uh, um, that, you know, the, I mean, there have been many, many risk assessment tools um, and some of them very sophisticated based on a lot of research. But the problem is that individual items or items in combination simply do not um, predict uh, suicidal behaviour, be it non-fatal or fatal, in a way that they can be used and relied upon. Um, and also, um, when patients have been asked about, you know, use of um, uh, of tools, particularly uh, maybe with from with less experienced clinicians using a sort of tick box box approach to you know, ticking off risk factors or or absence of risk factors. Um, patients find that extremely uh, off putting um, and it doesn't engender the empathy um, that were, that um, uh, I mentioned and, and, and Mari, men Mari mentioned just now. Um, that is so important to make patients feel more comfortable, more engaged, um, and more likely to benefit from uh, uh, assessment and probably from, therefore, from uh, subsequent intervention. So if I've understood the question correctly, I think the answer is we should be getting away from risk tools as such. I don't know, Karen, if you want to add anything to that. but No, no, I don't. That would have um, absolutely been my, my answer. And I think I'm pleased personally that we've shifted away from trying to find the perfect risk assessment tool because for me it, it's I, I've noticed much more of a leaning now now that we know they don't work in terms of prediction it's much more of a leaning on the relationship and, and empathy and collaboration and working together with the patient and the, and the family um, which is the most important um, aspect and, and Actually, on the subject of families there, there is a question here. How much do we include parents, carers, family, others uh, in information in, into the formulation? Um, I don't know whether you wanted to comment on that, Keith. Well, I mean, I think I think um, I think it's absolutely crucial, um, you know, um, whatever the age of, of the patient, I suppose in some ways, you know, one thinks particularly about young people and, and families, but of course, you know, it's really important uh, at any age to try and engage individuals who are important in a person's social family uh, or network who, are, uh, who it's appropriate to engage. Um, who are going to be, you know, crucial to um, supporting a person when they get into uh, 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 difficulties. So, um, yeah, it's uh, it, it's very, very important. I, 
I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking back, you know, to my training, and which was a long while ago, and uh, how sometimes one used to actually avoid getting engaged with families and uh, sort of focusing on the individual patients and almost treating, you know, the, the family as, as very separate and uh, how inappropriate that was. Thankfully, I learned very rapidly, but um, uh, engagement of uh, key others is absolutely crucial. I'm so sorry, someone's let the dog in. <laughs> Actually, I'll give you a quick one, other one, Keith, and then I'll mute myself. Personality disorders. I wonder if Keith has thoughts about with personality disorder presentations and robust self-harm suicide assessment and formulation. Do you have any top tips? Now, we, we have a very small amount of time, um, so but I'll ask you to sort of share your thoughts. But given that we've got a number of um, the questions around personality disorder, I'm thinking that, you know, we'll have another webinar at some point, perhaps focusing on suicide risk assessment and formulation with um, people with personality disorder. But if you've got any thoughts to share in, in a couple of minutes, that would be great. OK. Um, well, I mean, I, I, I guess that um, people, you know, people with um, personality disorders, particularly emotionally unstable personality disorders, then th these um, issues become even more crucial. Um, uh, and and the, the other sort of point, of course, is that the situation can be very changeable. Um, and which makes it really, I guess, difficult for clinicians uh, and, and also family members. But I would have thought the principles of what we've been talking about are, are absolutely, um, absolutely crucial here and especially clear communication. I think it's really important that there like to be to be multiple agencies involved in um, people's care who've got personality problems for various reasons, um, particularly if they also have, you know, co comorbid other uh, men uh, mental disorders. Um, and that um, clear communication between agencies and regular communication and ensuring that in a sense, everybody's um, talking, you know, singing to the same tune is going to be really, really important. Um, uh, including for uh, reducing risk um, of untoward outcomes. Um, so I think uh, I think the principles of what we've been discussing apply equally and even more so, if I can put it that way, um, to people with um, to working with people with personality disorders. Thank you, Keith. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I agree. And the, another question was around, is there any difference, um, you know, with, with young people? And again, I think the principles would, would be the same. There'll be particular issues and particular vulnerabilities that young people may encounter and may face, but the, the, the principles are universal, aren't they? Which is back to that sort of population approach, that this is, a, this is an approach we can use for everybody and any formulation must be individualised and and take into account that that individual person that we're working with. Um, thank you for all your questions. I don't think we're going to get the chance to answer all of them, but hopefully the, the subjects that have come up we have touched on. I just wanted also to let you know we, we've got two more in this series of, um, of webinars that are going to focus 